Good morning. This is, this is a real honor to, 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 uh, to join you. Thank you ever so much for this opportunity. Um, and especially uh, Kim and Maria, wonderful sort of segue. Isn't it great when you get some momentum and then you have these inspiring voices from the kids themselves? And the reason I kind of appreciate that is because it gives me that sort of momentum to the kind of work that, that I do, which is really to, uh, yes, to think about risk, but also to, to think about the other side of risk and what are the factors that, well, frankly, make it less random. I know sometimes we can think about, okay, we want, you know, you, you hear kids talking about all these factors, and I don't know about you, but when you're actually trying to implement or uh, initiate programs, you need, you need, in a sense, a little bit more order to it so it's reproducible. But fundamentally, though, I still learn in my work, though I'm a researcher and I'm a family therapist, but I still learn from the kids and the families with whom I'm, I'm, I've been privileged to sort of connect with. Let, let, me, let, let me just start there, if I could. Lately, I've been actually thinking about some colleagues of mine who are working in Medellin, Colombia. And Medellin, of course, it was the most violent place on earth a decade or two ago. And I was thinking a lot about my colleagues there because, of course, they've recently tried not quite, but they've been trying to set a peace accord in Colombia, which I'm sure you may have heard about. A while back when I was developing some theories of resilience, I was working with colleagues down there in the University of Antioquia, and specifically in Medellin. And it was so dangerous at the time that I wasn't even able to enter the communities where the research was taking place. I would have been murdered or kidnapped. That's changed, by the way, in the last decade or so. But when I went down there initially, I was introduced to some people who were actually talking about the resilience of children in this, the most violent place on earth. And um, what I met, well, I met this amazing principal. She's a short woman, very, 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 very sort of compact and, and, and yet so powerful in her being. It was kind of interesting. And what she talked about is that she'd kept her school open up there on the hillsides of Medellin, where all the violence was taking place. She'd kept her school open even when stray bullets had killed students on the playground. She had managed to, despite all the violence that was going on here in that particular place, she managed to create a space where kids, I guess, felt safe. And she told me the most remarkable stories of how kids were being counseled by their parents that even when there was gunfire in the streets, to simply stay behind a brick wall, wait till the gunfire had finished, and then make their way to school. Now, my kids, who are now in university, were at the time about the same age as some of the kids that she was teaching, and I thought to myself, my kids would never be that motivated to go to school. <laughs> what so a few years later, things had calmed enough that I was actually able to visit this woman at her school. And it was an eye-opening experience because I watched her walk around the school that had 1,000 students, 500 in two different shifts over the day. And as this principal walked around the school, the children followed her like, like sort of bees to honey or, or kids playing soccer. You know how they follow the ball, it doesn't matter which end of the field they're going to. And they'd swarm her, and every, as she came up, as each child came up to her, she would pause, and echoing many of the themes that we've heard this morning already, this, this, teach, this principal would pause, look at the child, off and up, because they were taller than her, and she would, she would say their name, and then did this little, very uh, la Latina thing, of course, where she would sort of give them a little embrace, and a little kiss on the cheek, and a little pat on the bottom, and send them on their way. There was this boy, as I was on the, on the playground, at one point this boy, who was 14 years old, was a very tall, lanky kid, he had just done something bad, thrown the janitor's broom over a fence or whatever, and after she kind of wagged a finger at him, excuse herself, called him by name and said, go get that broom and fix your mistake and all this kind of other stuff, and the kid, after he'd done what he was supposed to do and was being teased by his friends for being caught by the principal, he did this really neat thing. 14-year-old kid, stands about this tall, wanders over to the principal afterwards and sort of like a leaning tower sort of leans down like this and she wags a finger up at his face, reaches up, gives him a little kiss on the cheek and pushes him on his way. And it dawned on me, as I came back to Canada, it dawned on me that we are trying to create kids 
with that sort of emotional well-being. We are trying to create kids that have a sense of consequences. We're trying to create environments that will nurture kids. And it dawned on me, as I'd watched that episode down there in Colombia, that perhaps the problem in our systems right now in Canada, for example, especially in our schools, is that we don't kiss children enough. <laughs> and I'm not totally joking about that. <laughs> My understanding here is that to understand resilience, we have to understand what kids are experiencing. I mean, you, we are sitting here in Surrey, and there are problems in Surrey. I was here recently, also speaking to some of the schools and stuff. And there, you have challenges with violence in the streets. You have challenges related to social integration. Not, these are not unique only to Surrey. This is, of course, happening across Canada and indeed elsewhere. But I, as we want to sort of solve these problems, I'm beginning to think we need to flip the mindset, not just to be focusing on the risk factors, which, of course, are key to this discussion. We need to also understand resilience as a set of factors that respond to those risks. So Kim and I had a conversation before th this morning, and, and we had agreed that she would go first and talk about the risks so that then I could, in a sense, if I can get this to go forward, I would slip this, flip the conversation towards this interaction between the risk and the resilience factors. Now, Kim was referring to the adverse childhood experience studies. And if you look at some of the data from uh, Felitti and uh, Vincent Felitti and, and uh, others, what they in fact found was, yes, that as, if you look at the dark parts of those bar graphs, if you have four or more of those adverse childhood experiences, the odds of something like depression over your lifetime as an adult goes up. That makes sense. But here's the interesting thing. When I met Robert Anda, who was the contact for Felitti at the, the Centers for Disease Control, and I had the good privilege of having some conversations with Robert over the years, and I asked Robert, well, Robert, that's a very interesting bar graph, but you know, I'm sort of curious about this. Um, if you look, even if you have four or more adverse childhood experiences, 51% of people still do not develop depression. And I asked them, how do you explain that? What were the factors that produced the non-depression cohort? And he said very frankly to me, I don't know. We didn't study it. Millions of dollars were spent to figure out the bottom of the bar graph, and almost nothing was spent to figure out the top of the bar graph. So what I've been doing basically is going around the world and trying to figure out through whether, whether with children in uh, Tanzania or uh, in uh, Jerusalem or perhaps in southern Florida or Ireland or South Africa, Palestine, uh, China, um, or perhaps just back in Halifax where I live. We've been trying to understand what are these factors that actually make us resilient. And it's, it's a little bit more complicated than just simply saying, you know, some sort of inner quality. Because resilience is an interaction with our environments, I think we have to think in more interactive terms. So the definition that I'm going to suggest for resilience, rather than just thinking about it as strictly an internal process, I'm going to suggest that when there is adversity, that resilience is essentially, in the context of exposure to significant adversity, resilience is our capacity to navigate and negotiate for the resources that we need to do well. Now, it's a bit wordy, but I'm going to suggest that there's only really two concepts here that are important. One is we need to be able to navigate, and two, we need to be able to negotiate, meaning simply that we need to be able to help children find the resources and that, 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 they can, that they need. And the kids that you just saw in that video we're doing exactly that. They said, I need something, and obviously there's a serve and return with their world, and the return is that they get what they need. But it's the what you need that's key. So the, it's not just simply a matter of saying, okay, well, you know, you're going to provide a program to kids. It's about making sure that that program is culturally, contextually relevant to those particular individuals. <clears throat> The one I always use is if, you're, if, if, if the parents have had a very horrific experience with the education system, and certainly in terms of our indigenous peoples and what we're learning about the horrific legacy, the cultural genocide 
that they experienced through the legacy of the residential schools. If that experience is your history as an adult with schooling, then your, the meaning system that you construct about whether or not education is relevant for your child is of course going to be skewed. And that, that we cannot ignore this, con, this, 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 this dynamic between the risk factors that we face, the meaning systems we construct, and then what is actually going to be the tipping point for a factor that's going to create resilience. Now, let me, let me it's, it's morning time, so I can show a structural equation model, not make everyone too woozy, I hope. Um, look, we, we took about eight years and a, like about a million bucks to try and create this one little parachute looking diagram. And I, it brought a tear to my eye when it was first brought to me by one of our status, uh, statistical gurus who was working on the data. But let me just simply talk about, let me just give you some substance to, some substance, substance to, to this for a second. Um, what we were curious about in one of our big multi-site studies with kids who are using lots and lots of services, what we were curious about was, what is the connection between, well, the risk factors that you face, um, your services that you use, and your experience of those services? And we found these very interesting patterns that I think speak to what we, as people who are caring, who want to help kids, need to keep in mind when we're trying to build resilience. And it works a little bit like this, if I could. What we first of all did was we, we separated individual risk from contextual risk. And then we also talked about uh, service use experience. So when you were using services and supports in your community, what was your experience of those? And finally, we said, over your lifetime, what kinds of supports have you had? What kinds of formal services have you had? Now, here's an interesting thing. We talk about resilience as just something, well, we, we, we understand, I think, that it is something that's facilitated. It's, yes, it's inside of us. It's, there's a set of qualities, a goodness of heart there. But it takes that community to, to nurture it. But what, what exactly do we have to do? Well, the first thing I want to show you here is simply that the relationship between kids who experience more contextual risk factors and the lifetime use of services is not strong. In fact, we thought that the kids who had more risks in their lives would be receiving more services. But that's not the case. Isn't that weird? Shouldn't the kids most in the most disadvantaged communities be getting the most services? But that's actually not what our data showed from hundreds and hundreds of kids. And what's furthermore is when the kids come out of contextually risky and dangerous places, that red line over to service use with the minus 21 simply tells us that they have a really crappy experience when they finally do get services. They don't like the services they get. They're not relevant to them. So not only are, are they not getting enough services or more services, they're also not getting services that they like. Now, here's the other interesting thing, because we want to change functional outcomes. We want kids to not use drugs, to not drop out of school, to not get into high-risk sexual activity. These are some of the things that we expect of them or want them to experience. But what we found was that, that there had to be, to, 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 to realize all this, what we began to see was a particular was a particular pattern, I'm just going to go there, was a particular relationship between all these different variables. And it kind of looks like this. You see, the most important thing was giving kids a positive service use experience. Kind of comes back to that special person, that special service that, that gives them all the connections that they need. But the, those connections, though, translate into a set of resilience capacities, all kinds of resources that they get. And it's those resources then that flow and change their behaviors. We've messed this up. Sometimes we think that if we just flood kids with more assessments, more psychological treatment, more interventions, that we can actually fix their behaviors. And the research is now teasing this apart. Resilience researchers are beginning to understand that, no, 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 you're doing it wrong. Fundamentally, what we are talking about is continuity of engagement so that then kids realize a whole lot of different aspects of their lives. They get the kinds of resources they need, and then, then the behaviors change. More services, and I say this cautiously, what we're actually learning, I'm going to go out on a limb and say this. More services do not produce more resilient kids. That's actually the opposite. 
When we just keep bouncing kids between service providers, we are actually likely, from our research at least, to show you are actually doing more harm than good. What kids want is that consistency of an engaging, like that principal, on the playground who basically connects with that kids. You want those kids to feel something there, and then through those relationships that are fundamental, they want the resources. They don't want to go see a psychometrician, and then an anger management specialist, and then a, a reading coach, and then an extra person. They don't want all those people in their lives. And frankly, our research suggests that that's harming them. That constant bouncing without the consistency of the core team to work with them. Now, there are in here some, some, some more, you know, there are a core set of things which make more sense to kids that actually they need. And if you want to read more, in the book I Still Love You, I go through this in great depth. But really, just let me give you a really quick snapshot. Kids need all nine of these things, and a good relationship is fundamental to that, but it's not the only thing. And in fact, th these nine things sort of work together. So kids, of course, need structure and consequences, which when my kids were in high school, I remember my son was in high school, they were having a problem with food fights in the cafeteria. And because they were having, the, then the, you know, the teachers were meeting and the student council was meeting and everyone was meeting to try and solve this problem of the food fights. And at one point, there was this big fight and the, they had cameras in the school. They knew which kids had started it. And my son came home, he was on student council, and, he sa and I said to him, well, what did they do about the kids that they caught you know, on the cameras having the food fight? And before he could say anything, I blurted it out. I said, I bet you that they're going to make those kids come in tomorrow and clean up that cafeteria. What an evil thing those kids did. They must have, they, I bet they're going to have to help the janitors in the school, the custodians, fix their mess. I bet you that's what the consequence is for those kids. And my son did that thing that teenagers would do to you. You know, he kind of rolled his eyes at me. I said, well, well, well what did I say? He said, they're not going to do anything like that. I said, well, what did they do to the kids? They suspended them. I said, come on, nobody could be that stupid. I actually said that, uh, by the way. <laughs> Who, as an adult, could be so thick as to suspend those children for having a food fight instead of developing the conditions to facilitate learning by bringing them back in to actually clean up the mess that they made? And the reason, my son said, the reason they couldn't have the kids do that was because of occupational health and safety laws. <laughs> I said, what? He said, supposedly, once the food is on the ground, if you take your tuna fish sandwich and it goes on the ground, once it's on the floor, it's a toxic substance, and you need, like, hazmat suits or something <laughs> to pick it up. <laughs> now, what I'm learning from all this is that we facilitate resilience. We create conditions where kids can grow. And when we fail as adults, Kids miss those opportunities. They're not able to navigate or negotiate for what they need. Of course, other things are important. This is, this is not a random list. I didn't develop this list by sitting around reading the literature of a bunch of white men who think have all been trained from the same psychology books. This list came out of massive amounts of experience of pe working with, uh, with communities all around the globe that taught us, yes, structure and consequences, yes, parent-child connections, but many cultures are more collectivist than mine. And they also said that children don't just need that one primary caregiver, they also need lots and lots of other relationships as well. And in fact, I'm going to even go out on a limb to say, the primary caregiver is often the most burdened person in a child's life. And, you know, we overemphasize that sometimes when, in fact, there's other supports. How many of you who, maybe you're in schools or something, how many of you have ever seen a child connect to the janitor in the school? Right? You know that children navigate to who they need when they're in a crisis. Um, children need a powerful identity. They need to walk like John Travolta in Saturday Night Fever. Some of you are old enough to remember that movie. The way he kind of, you know, struts down the street, right? Kids need to have a, a sense of control, a sense of efficacy, politically, otherwise. 
When I was in Israel and Palestine and comparing the way children cope with the sense of disempowerment within that sort of context of war, you see children actually trying to meaningfully involve themselves in the politics of their people. Um, I'm also sense that, that, that it's really key that kids experience a sense of belonging or spirituality or their sense of the continuity in their culture. Um, children need their rights respected and to have reasonable responsibilities. And indeed, they also need to ba basically experience basic safety and supports. And when we collectively create those conditions for children, what I'm understanding is that they respond to the risks in their lives and they're able to be, to use Kim's uh, phrasing again, they get inoculated. The more that we create conditions to facilitate access to no, those nine things, the more likely they are to sort of undo negative or risky exposures. It's a dynamic process. It's, it, goes, it goes back and forth. Now, the, the thing that's been kind of worrying me, frankly, is that here in North America, I go around the globe looking at kids. I study kids who actually have stories to tell me about resilience. And then I come back to North America, and even here in Canada, and it's like we are purposely disadvantaging children by not giving them access to those nine things. Those school administrators who basically said to the kids who were in this food fight, we're not going to let you have a reasonable consequence or a chance to fix your mistake or have responsibility for your actions or treat you respectfully so that you can actually fix your mistakes or give you a more powerful idea. No, we're going to just treat you as incompetence and we're going to send you home and let you sit on the couch for three days playing gaming systems or whatever and we're going to, we're going to create a lack of resilience in you. Now, what we're, actually, we're paying a price for this as Canadians. This is data from the Canadian Institutes of Health, Health Informatics. It's, clo it's clearly showing that anxiety disorders in our children are going up. Every other form of emergency room visit or medical intervention in our children, generally speaking, they're either flat or going down. But children are showing up and are actually being hospitalized more often now than the, uh, 10 years ago for th mood and anxiety disorders. Something is going wrong. This can't just be explained that we're better at diagnosing. This has also, also got to be explained. This kind of dramatic shift has to also be explained by something that we are not giving children to survive and thrive. Now, I, I want to bring you a little bit of a good news piece to this, too. Because around the world, people are addressing these problems. They are thinking about ways to make kids more resilient. A, a, a recent example I had shown me in Australia, in Perth actually, where they want to get kids back out into nature, right? They want kids not to be sort of, Jim, you're talking about bubble wrapping kids and, and all that stuff. We want kids to be more robust. In Perth, what they've done is they actually took six million dollars and, well, created a forest, just like a regular, just looks like a regular, and it's a playground. Kids spend two, on average, two hours in a playground like this where there is no playground equipment. What they do is they just go and muck around in the mud. Absolutely. But now this being Australia, and of course they, were, you know, they had to deal with the insurers and everything else, and what they did was they test the water in this little part of the park. They, they make sure there's no E. coli, and they make sure there's no snakes. You know, because this is Australia and everything can kill you there. Um, <laughs> now, it's interesting, though, <clears throat> because I hear sometimes people say, oh, no, no, we can't have snowball fights anymore, right? We, 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 we have to sort of uh, pay more attention. We, 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 we've got to be really the, the constantly afraid for our kids. Mm. And actually, what the Australians in this case did, I thought, I love the way they solved the problem. They worked with the insurers. They worked with the health and safety people. And what they discovered, for example, was that you create environments for kids where they can realize some self-efficacy and a powerful identity and a sense of you know, control and all these kinds of other things. So they built the park like that. Now, interestingly, it's deceptive. Within this, within this forested area, there is no place where a child can fall more than 1.6 meters. <laughs> now, supposedly, supposedly, if you, if a child can, if a child, up to 1.6 meters, a child cannot kill themselves. Now, I'm not sure how they found that out. Did they, <laughs> 1.2 meters? No, the child survived. 1.4 meters? One, like, I don't know how they figured out the 1.6 meters. 
Um, but they did. And in fact, when they, when they were working on the design of this park, unfortunately, when they put that, you know that big log there? Every child loves to climb a, a log, right? When they put that log in, the insurers came in and they measured and said, oh, sorry, it's, it's more than 1.6 meters. It has to go. But the Australians being very sort of the Australian, very, very, you know, very strong people, they said, they, said, they said back to the insurers, hey, we've got a better solution to this. We'll put a second log in. And now when the child falls off the first log, they bounce off the second log, and then they hit the water. <laughs> By the way, I'm not making this up. This is a completely true story. So that is, I'm going to argue that we can use that. We can use those ideas. Let me, let, me, let me switch this back to you for a minute. Let me ask you to think about a child who you're really struggling with. I don't care what the age is of the child. You're really struggling. Maybe, I'm assuming most of us are professionals, or maybe you're a parent here as parents. Think of a child who's really struggling. And I want to put you through a very simple exercise here of thinking about, the, from the child's perspective, how many of these resilience resources do they have? So here are some questions to ask about the child, OK? So, 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 so how would the child answer these questions? All right, you ready? So for structure, there are people in my life who expect me to blank. Can the child fill that in? And expectations can sometimes be excessive, but at least there should be some expectations. Consequences, when I don't meet expectations, I know that blank will happen. Can the child that you're struggling with, the child that's maybe a little more vulnerable or at risk, can they answer, can they answer that question? Next question, um, I can reach out to my blank to get help when I need it. Does the child have that in their life? I feel respected for what's special about me when I'm with or at, or doing. Again, does the child have those things um, in their life? Uh, oops, I'm sorry, I didn't finish it. Power and control. Um, in my blank, I get to participate in making decisions that affect my blank. Belonging. At my blank, people miss me when I'm not there. Again, coming back to that sense of, did somebody call me by name in the hallways? Next, a sense of culture. There are places such as blank where I can celebrate my culture and my beliefs. When I'm with others at my blank, I feel treated fairly. When I'm with blank, I am responsible for myself, for others, in a very genuine way. Um, I'm well cared for by blank, and I feel safe when I'm with or at that particular place. My experience is that when I'm working with more vulnerable, at-risk children, if you want those labels, what I'm really doing is I'm facilitating environments to give them access to those answers to those kinds of questions. And I'm going to argue that we as professionals, whether we're from schools or community groups or wherever, that is our fundamental job. Not just about suppressing disorder or with, you know, getting rid of risk. It's also about building all the capacities I mean, think about it. All those adverse childhood experiences, the, the, the ones that we talked about, of physical abuse, of mental illness in a family, all those things, those are all environmental things that we can change. But we can also change environments around kids to give them access to the answers to these kinds of questions. And when we do, I'm going to argue magical things do indeed happen. And I know that from some very <laughs> rigorous scientific databases like this. Look, when you take a story, let's deconstruct, uh, let's deconstruct this. I'll bring this fully around. Let me, let me deconstruct Cinderella for a second, all right? And please, I'm going to have to ask you to tolerate all the incredibly sexist parts of Cinderella, because, I mean, think about it. There's a whole lot of sexist overlays. But if we can just suspend those just for mildly for a second here. Um, look, Cinderella is a story of a child. She was well loved early on, right, by her mother and her father. And then her father dies, and she's left with the quote unquote evil stepmother and the three evil stepsisters, right? And again, we can leave all that judgment aside for a second. But what saves Cinderella? We would be misnaming this story. In fact, I've always thought Cinderella is, is a badly named story because the whole focus is on her. 
right? It's like she somehow exuded something and was resilient and survived and got the prince again. Who cares? I got the prince and all that other kind of stuff, right? Well, okay, but let's think about it. Is it really her story or is it the story of the fairy godmother? We are fairy godmothers, right? We the fairy godmother is what made it possible for Cinderella to do so well. And that's just not an opinion. That's actually what the research says that most of the variance, the change in life trajectories is not internal. It's actually internal facilitated by external. It's that interactional process of something inside of us that then is facilitated by a positive and adaptive environment. So actually the story is really about the fairy godmother because let's face it, the reason she succeeds is because she, well, she has lots of little friends who are mice and birds and stuff, but she also has a fairy godmother that can turn pumpkins into carriages. Who's not going to do well in life if you have someone who can turn pumpkins into carriages, right? And let's face it, I mean, if Cinderella had not had the fairy godmother, probably by the age of 15 or 16, she would have basically said to her evil stepmother, you know, you, I'm out of here. <laughs> She would have run away. She would have, she would have ended up somewhere, probably not in the palace with the prince. She would have probably ended up behind the palace on the streets, maybe turning tricks for, for drugs or trying to stay. I, I, I'm sorry to suggest that maybe she would have ended up on the street. I'm not making light of this, but seriously, I work with these kids. They don't, they don't have a fairy godmother. They end up on the streets because there are no other places and no one is facilitating their access to the resources they need that would be meaningful to them. So resilience for me, based on theoretical like, ideas like this, is simply yes, that that is fundamentally what we need. Now, I'm, I'm pretty much out of time here. The last thing, the last thought, I just want to leave you with a couple of quick last thoughts. One is, there is a theory of differential impact in all this. And what that says is that you, me, we matter most to the children who are most vulnerable. The higher the vulnerability, the more those factors, those nine things I've been talking about, matter in children's lives. If a child has a lot of resources, then chances are they'll slip through life and somehow the other will work out. Mostly. They still need us. But as risk increases, that moment when a teacher greets them by name, or that moment that there is a coach who notices their skill level, or the moment they have proper housing or a violence-free community, those things matter much more to those children who are most vulnerable. The principal in Colombia mattered most to the children who are the most vulnerable in her community. And that's the notion of differential impact and why we fundamentally do that. The other thought I really just want to sort of uh, end here with is that this, this notion of resilience is also morphing, is still growing. We understand resilience fairly well for children that come from people like me, in my social location, as the kind of families. We begin, we're getting a good handle on the factors that kids need to do well. But once we diversify the sample somewhat and we begin to think about Canadian, well, our indigenous peoples, if we begin to think about the, the immigrants, the refugees that are now coming to Canada, 58% of the Syrian refugees will be children, who are children, I should say. When we begin to look at other populations around the globe, we need to begin to diversify this conversation to better understand resilience, not just from that one set of principles, but to understand it across multiple contexts and life histories and experiences. And it's that dynamic between the risks people experience and the resources we provide them that actually make them more resilient. And I'm humbled by that thought because I, this is a, a decade ago when we were beginning to do this research on resilience, I went to places like Tanzania and my children would come with me. And I remember at one point my, my daughter went to school with some of uh, the children of my colleagues and I went back at lunch hour and took a picture of, of her and some of her new friends at, at the school. And I love this photo. By the way, if you can't pick her up, my daughter's the uh, fifth <laughs> one in. You never know. Um, I love the photo simply because she's outnumbered on that bench and that is my takeaway a little bit for you is that the children you're working with, we need to ask them what it is that makes them resilient. We need to understand it from their social location, their vantage point and that's the conversation that has to continue to ongo. We need these other girls' perspectives. We know a fair bit about my daughter's perspective. 
on resilience, but we need as well to diversify that conversation. And with that, I simply want to say, I think this is such a wonderful topic to sort of move forward with. I so appreciate the invitation. And on that note, I'll simply say thank you very much for listening. <laughs>